welcome to another spooky episode of Kodo Cinema, the podcast show where I talk about movies. I bid you welcome as your host, Mark Kodo, aka Kodo Man. Well folks, Kodo Cinema Horror Month, and for this episode, I am going to talk about Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Oh boy, this will be a this will be a cool episode to talk about. Because uh, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire is a 2024 American supernatural comedy film. Now, of course, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire serves as one of the ma- serves uh, serves as the follow up to Ghostbusters Afterlife, and of course, being a part of the Ghostbusters franchise, it is the fifth overall installment of the overall Ghostbusters movies. Now. Before I uh, dive into the movie, I just want to give you my background on uh, Ghostbusters. I have seen the first two original Ghostbusters movies. I have also seen the 2016 uh, all-female reboot of Ghostbusters, including Ghostbusters Afterlife. Now, of course, to let you all know, Ghostbusters, the Ghostbusters franchise is celebrating its 40th anniversary because the original Ghostbusters movie came out in 1984. 2024 marks the 40th anniversary and Ghostbusters Frozen Empire came out this year. Now Ghostbusters Frozen Empire came out on March 14th of of 2024 in New York City while it, while it came out in the United States in March of in March on March 22nd of this year. Now, like I said, I have seen all fo- all the other. F- I have seen the. F- I have seen all four movies, including. Now, as I mentioned, I have seen all four movies, but I've also went to see Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire in theaters, and I'll say this: uh, Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire. It's a fun movie. It's a fun but flawed movie at the same time. But I enjoyed it. Now, like I said. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire is the sequel to Ghostbusters Afterlife and the fourth mainline installment and the fifth o- and the fifth overall film in the Ghostbusters franchise. Now, of course, the fourth mainline installment, this is basically jumping over jumping over the um, 2016 2016 Ghostbusters movie because if you remember in the trailer, if you remember in the trailer in one of the trailers for Ghostbusters Afterlife Paul Rudd's character, Paul Rudd, who plays um, Gary Gruberson, he stayed. He said that there hasn't been. He said that in the trailer and, of course, the film as well as the film itself, there hasn't been a ghost sighting in 30 years. So basically, this this erases the, this erased this entire quote erased the 2016 Ghostbusters film out of sight. It's no longer canon for that 2016 Ghostbusters movie, but also, but still, it still doesn't help that, it still doesn't help that it's, it's based, it's still part of the franchise, it's still a part of the franchise, but at the same time, it's, it's not canon, it's not even canon anymore, due to the fact of how bad the 2016 Ghostbusters movie really was. Now look, if you guys, now look, if you, if you like the 2016 Ghostbusters movie, that's fine. That's but this is just my opinion, all right. But anyway, Paul Rudd, who plays Gary Gruberson, is a main character in the new Ghostbusters movie, and and uh, and playing alongside with him is Carrie Coon, Finn Wolfhard, McKenna Grace, Celeste O'Connor, and Logan Kim, who all reprise their roles from the Ghostbusters Afterlife movie, alongside Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Ernie Hudson, Annie Potts. And William a- Atherton, reprising their characters from the earlier movies. Now, Bill Murray, Bill Murray pl- plays Dr. Peter Venkman. Dan Aykroyd plays Dr. Raymond Ray Stantz. Ernie Hudson plays Dr. Winston Zedmore. Annie Potts plays Janine Melnitz, and William Atherton plays Walter Peck. Now Harold Ramis, Harold Ramis, Her- Harold Ramis, who passed away in 2014, he played Egon Spangler, and Egon has has a family in the in the new movies, which feature which um, which is basically Callie Spangler, Trevor Spangler, and Phoebe Spangler, and Phoebe's played by McKenna Grace, 
Trevor Spangler is being played by Finn Wolfhard, and Callie Spangler, who is the mother to Trevor and Phoebe, she's being played by Carrie Coon. Now, now we move now, now we move now moving forward. We have other cast members, which includes Kumail Nagiani, Patton Oswalt, Emily Allen Lind, and James A and James A. Caster. And this movie, this movie is set three years after the events of Afterlife, and the veteran Ghostbusters must join force must join forces with their successors to save the world from a death chilling god in New York City who seeks to build a spectral army. Now that alone sounds like a good plot to a sequel, and this is real good. Now this is a good good plot. This is a good plot idea right there. And to me, and to me, that sounds awesome. But unfortunately, the film does fall into, I want to say more, in, now the film itself, it has its fair share of writing problems, especially with the Frozen, especially the fact that you have a title that says Frozen Empire, when barely the Frozen Empire storyline appeared in the, at the end of the movie. Like sure, it it was building up, but unfortunately, the overall execution of it appeared at the very end of the movie. Now I will dive in. Now I will break down this movie too, just to let y'all know. But I want to. I want. I just wanted to bring up. I just want to talk about who who was involved, who directed the movie. Now the director of the movie is Gil Kennan, who also wrote the screenplay with Jason Reitman. Now, Jason Reitman is the son of Ivan Reitman. Ivan Reitman was the original director for the first two original Ghostbusters movies. And Gil Cannon, uh, Gil Cannon, um, for those of you who don't know who Gil Cannon is, Gil Cannon is a filmmaker. One of, the, one of his early movies that he directed was the, was the, two, was the 2006 supernatural hor horror comedy and motion capture movie Monster House which came out in 2006 and Gil Kennan directed that movie and he also directed Poltergeist which came out in 2015 and he was involved as a writer and executive producer for Ghostbusters Afterlife including a including a director including a boy called Christmas he is also set to write and produce the upcoming the upcoming Saturday night film which was basically based which is basically based on the events of of the original Saturday night live. So that's so that's something so that that is something exciting. So so that's something exciting. And Jason Reitman, like I said, he's the son of Ivor Reitman. He actually directed Ghostbusters Afterlife. And and he's taking a back seat for uh, Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire. Plus, he's also directing the Saturday Night the Saturday Night movie alongside Gil Kennan. So both of these guys are going big in Hollywood, right? Right there. So, so both of these guys have been doing pretty well with film projects lately. So I'll give these two credit for that. They both know how to work together. So at the same time, sounds great. Now, anyway, uh, just to also also to put into this, yes, the uh, yes, the Ghostbusters franchise is celebrating its 40th anniversary, and 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 of and of course, it's it is a big celebration for the 40th anniversary of the first movie, which probably explains why the Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire came out this year, and makes sense. You want to honor the first Ghostbusters movie, and that's great, and that's great, that's great. Even the franchise as a whole. Like this franchise came out like this franchise started in 1984 and and 40 years later it's still going even though yes the Ghostbusters movies have their own flaws particularly the um, 2016 movie now yes there is also a TV show that came out although unfortunately I've never watched the the Ghostbusters TV show I ne I've never seen it to be honest but I've heard about but I, but I do know that this that the show exists, but also to add on to it, Ivan Reitman, who directed the first two Ghostbusters movie, he passed away in 2022, which was uh, two years ago, and he posthumously receives credits as a posthumous producer 
alongside his son, uh, Jason Reitman, and of course, and, and of course, uh, Jason Blum Blumfeld as well. The film is dedicated to his memory, and of course, ce and, and of course, celebrates the 40th anniversary of the first film. So, with that being s and and with that being said, uh, the film, as I mentioned, came out came out in March of this year, and it received mixed reviews from critics, but unfortunately, it received a positive feedback from audiences, and the film grossed over two and the film grossed two hundred and one million dollars worldwide, on a budget of a hundred million dollars. So, with that being said, like. I got a feeling that while the film, I got a feeling the film didn't turn a profit from what I just read. Like, yeah, it made two hundred one million dollars on a budget of hundred million dollars, so it somewhat made its money back. But at the same time, it didn't turn a profit. I feel like this this film should have made a little more money. Like, it is a, in my opinion, it's still a good movie. But even though it has flaws, it's still a fun movie to watch. Like the original film, like the original Ghostbusters movie, it made two hundred and ninety six point six million dollars on a budget of twenty five to thirty million dollars. And uh, Ghostbusters two Ghostbusters two made two hundred and fifteen point four million dollars and that movie came out in nineteen eighty nine. As for um as for the twenty sixteen film as for the twenty sixteen film, it made two hundred and twenty nine million dollars on a budget of 144 million but unfortunately with that movie it became a box office bomb with losses of over 70 million dollars following theaters taking their revenue cut which which will later lead into Ghostbusters Afterlife which made 204.3 million dollars on a budget of 75 million as for now going back to Frozen Empire Frozen Empire made 201.9 million dollars on a budget of 100 million dollars. And the first film, the first film is basically the highest grossing installment of the Ghostbusters franchise overall. So the first film still holds up. It it basically holds up so well to the point where um the, to the point where 40 years later while the while Ghostbusters and Frozen Empire made 201 million dollars it didn't turn a profit, so you know whatever. But I, I hope there's more films. I hope that I hope the franchise continues because I want to see more Ghostbusters. Because after I walked out of this movie, I wanted more. I wanted to see more Ghostbusters. I wanted to see more of this, and I believe this franchise should continue. Now I'm going to break down this movie right now. So. Anyway, let's strap on our proton packs because we're about to go we're about to we're about to bust some ghosts with in Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. So the movie opens up in New York in 1904 where we see a bunch of firefighters who are rushing into a burning hotel when they came across a room filled entirely of ice and one of the men who plays back a, a recording of the scene on an old, on an old speaker and what's real what's real and what's real interesting is that the entire room is frozen and we get this guy who's playing this recording. His hand was so frozen that it came off instantly. Oof. That's like one of the first few moments that we see in this movie. We see a frozen hand getting cut off. Like, damn, that is crazy. But there's also hints of what we're going to see throughout the movie. Although, unfortunately, we see that at the end of the movie just a throw it out there and you get to see a glimpse of the threat the villain the villain's name is Garaka and he's basically like this frozen ice demon and he's being trapped inside this golden orb to which uh, one of the fire protectors is one of the fire one of the fire protectors is protecting this orb and we cut and we jump straight forward to modern day where the Spangler family and Gary Gruberson chase down an ice dragon through through the streets of New York City, and Phoebe rides in a seat at the side of the Ghostbuster car before finally capturing it with a with with a zapper. Their close friends, Podcast and Domingo, have moved back to New York City to help aid the other two Ghostbusters, 
Winston Zedmore and Ray Stance, and eventually they capture the ghost from Hell's Kitchen and turn it into the mayor, who is now their longtime rival, Walter Peck. Walter is not pleased about the damage done to his town, and he threatens to stop the Ghostbusters once and for all. And this results in Callie, who is the mother to, um, to Trevor and uh, Phoebe, removes Phoebe from the team until she is 18. Okay, so the setup for this, so basically the opening of this movie starts off very well. Like, we get the uh, Spangler family chasing after a, an ice dragon ghost through, through New York City, which came out of Hell's Kitchen. And, of course, uh, Phoebe ba basically, you know, causing a lot of chaos throughout the town. Now, now that's a good, now this is a good, now this is a good start. Knowing the fact that it's showing, uh, it's showing us of where, of where this film is starting off. And what I find interesting is the fact that Phoebe is now taking, Phoebe is basically, you know, is a reckless ghost buster, so, so to speak. She's not thinking about what she, what the conse of the consequences of her actions are going to deal with. Like she destroyed, she literally to tore down a boatload of buildings with her proton pack. I mean, does she realize the amount of damage she has costed on this city? Probably millions of dollars. And this this has happened before in Ghostbusters Afterlife, where she destroyed part of a part of the part of a town part of a small small town and I believe is in Oklahoma which is in Ghostbusters Afterlife like she destroyed part of a part of a town which caused like basically about hundreds of thousands of dollars in that town now we cut to New York and this is basically hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars like that's a lot more money this is basically you know calling it back to Phoebe being reckless from the first movie because Phoebe is obviously reckless in terms of how to catch a ghost with the proton pack, especially when it comes to, especially when driving in that seat. And then Walter Peck, Walter Peck, who's being played by William Atherton, he's basically the mayor in this movie. So, for those of you, for those of you who don't know, Walter Peck was the inspector in the first Ghostbusters movie, and he's basically like, he's basically the secondary antagonist who who literally released. All the ghosts, who for who really released all the ghosts from the from the Ghostbusters firehouse and and set it off to the world because and, you know he's basically he wants to inspect it he wants to inspect it not not knowing the fact that if he released all these ghosts it'll be on his hands because the Ghostbusters were bas basically catching ghosts and from from Walter Peck's side of things he's like he's not a fan of the Ghostbusters he's bas he's basically your He's basically a rival. Basically, gets everything of what the Ghostbusters are doing, and he says this quote: "They call themselves Ghostbusters. According to these hacks, they saved the world. No eyewitnesses, and who is found to carry the torch? Descendants of Egon Spangler." Like that. That quote was cut from this movie, and I don't understand why. I mean, there's a there are some some scenes and lines that were cut from this movie. Just you know. I guess they were trying to balance out the. I guess they were just. I guess they didn't want to overextend the runtime. But at the same time, why cut out important stuff that is related? Why cut out important stuff from the trailer that could have been played in the movie? Just saying, and and Walter Peck tells and Walter Peck chats with the Spangler family, and um and and comes to realize that Phoebe is fifteen years old. Wow. Phoebe's older brother uh, Trevor is 18 years old, so, so the Walter Pack is like, huh? Why? Well, Phoebe is still a kid. She shouldn't be even. She shouldn't be, you know, using a proton pack, or even, or even be. Or she shouldn't be even be using this proton pack. Even Trevor's like, oh come on, this proton pack is safe. But Phoebe even said, no, sir, this proton pack is not. It's not safe. Like, yeah. Yeah, you get it, you get it. But, but anyway, the Fe the entire Spangler family um, decided to bench Phoebe for throughout the rest of the movie. And to get over her disappointment of being dropped from the Ghostbusters, Phoebe goes out to play chess with the ghost of a girl whose name is Melody. Who, who, and her name is uh, Melody, and Melody is a ghost girl who died in a, fi in a fire accident. 
And of course, later on, we get to see Ray and Podcast. Now, Ray is being played by Dan Aykroyd, while Podcast is being played by Logan Kim. And just to double back for a second, uh, Phoebe is being played by Phoebe is being played by McKenna Grace. Trevor is being played by Finn Wolfhard, who you may know him for Stranger Things. And then of course Carrie, Co- and then of course Carrie Coon plays the mom named uh, Cal and Nick Callie Spangler, and then of course Gary Gruberson being played by Paul Rudd. So, so anyway, so anyway, uh, Ray and Podcast had people delivering all sorts of crazy cursed items, which Podcast would inspect for abnormal activity. And during a search, he comes across a bunch of mini Stave Puff marshmallows, who begin to wreak havoc. And back upstairs, a man named Nadim Razmadi, being played by Camille Nagiani, who pops in and hands hands them an old orb, which he claims to be cursed, with some writing in Arabic on the side, which he inherited from his grandmother. And Ray determines that the orb to be needs to be, to be a, and Ray determines that the orb is a trap for supernatural beings because of its copper alloys being used in supernatural rituals during the Bronze Age. Now moving forward, uh, Ray elevate, ev- Ray evaluates the, or- evaluates the orb and its psychokinetic energy before it explodes, emitting broad-spectrum sy- cyanic energy throughout the town, and it eventually gets to the firehouse, damaging the nearly full compartment where they keep all the specters of the past. Meanwhile, up in the attic, Trevor comes across a bunch of candy wrappers on the ground. As he approaches them, there is a green ghost who comes out and begins flying around the room. Now, to now, of course, y'all know who this green ghost is. That is right, Slimer. We get we get to see Slimer in this movie. Now, anybody who knows who Slimer is, he is obviously one of the original ghosts from the first two Ghostbusters movie. And by the way. Slimer was the first ghost that that Venkman, Ray, and Egon were able to capture in the first movie. So that was like their first ghost that they that they were able to capture. And of course, this is the first time that Trevor is meeting Slimer, and he gets slimed in the face by Slimer, and and Trevor's reaction was like, yeah. Yeah, he got slimed all right. I mean, holy crap, man. He got slimed. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, anyway, moving forward, Ray, um, moving forward, Ray tries to do further research on the orb in his own private paranormal research center with the help of Dr. Lars Pinfield, and they try and collect some energy from the orb to no avail. However, the orb's power is strong enough to disrupt one of the ecto confinements, allowing one of the specters to to escape and hide the podcast's equipment. Lars, Trevor, and Lucy Lars, Trevor, and Lucy go and speak to Nadim, who reveals that his grandmother kept the orb a secret from him and hid it and hide it in a brass lined chamber. Peter Vakeman walks in and reveals that N- Nadim has latent pyrokinetic powers and this is a call a bit of a callback to the first movie where um where Dana where Dana and uh Louis Tully um they were basically being they were basically being test they're basically they were basically doing this like they were basically being tested by you know Peter Bakeman and the rest of the Ghostbusters from the first movie so this is a bit of a callback to it. Now I will also get back to Dana pretty soon because uh, Dana was a he was a main character in the in the first two Ghostbusters movie, so I'll get to that soon. So Ray goes to meet a New York research librarian named Dr. Hubert Wardsky, who is being played by Patton Oswalt, and proceeds to tell the story of how the orb was created four thousand years ago in Southwest Asia by a group of sorcerers called the Firemasters. The Firemasters wanted to capture a phantom god named Garaka, who plotted to take over the wor- to take over the world with his undead army. They would use the, the Kusharit Umulti, the death chill, as the power to kill with fear itself. 
Nadim's grandmother, along with Nadim himself, are one are of a uh, bl- are of a blood lineage of fire masters. And one of the fire masters even preve- prevented Garaka from breaking free of the orb in 1904. Witless, the Manhattan Adventurers Society, where who were doing a mock ritual of whom Garaka froze to death. It was also revealed that Garaka was vulnerable to brass, brass, fire, and the fact that his horns were cut off, trapped Garaka in the orb. Now that sounds like an interesting villain right there, Garaka. Garaka, who's basically a, who's basically a frozen, who's basically a frozen demon-like monster, who really wants to freeze everything and 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 turn every and and turn and turn the entire world into a brand new ice ice age, while while unfolding a ghost army. Now that sounds like an interesting villain. Now, sure, yes, Gozer is always Gozer. The Gozerian is the main villain of of the Ghostbusters, and Gozer has appeared in two in two of the Ghostbusters movies, the original and Ghostbusters Afterlife. Now, of course, obviously, she's of course now, of course, Gozer is obviously trapped in Ghostbusters Afterlife, and now we get introduced to a new villain named Garaka. Now, Garaka, in my opinion, it sounds like is basically a great villain, but at the same time, and I will get to him more later. I will get to him more later on in the end. He should have deserved more. He he deserves more screen time than what he was given. But I will get to that when I get to it. So anyway, there was this another ghost in the. There is also this ghost. There is another ghost who is named, who is being called the Possessor, and it's basically this red, misty, lightning ghost, who is very small. And could possess anything. This little ghost took a reco- some sort of a recording that Doctor that Doctor Wartsky was was presenting to Ray and Phoebe, and of course this um this uh, this this ghost took it. This ghost took it, put it in a garbage bag, and this garbage bag is possessed, and it and it walks outside, um, and, and we will later and will later possess a lion statue outside the library. It's attacking Ray and Phoebe. Phoebe tries to stop it, ultimately destroying even more of the town and gets arrested. The group attempts to stop the ghost from, you know, destroying the recording before Walter Peck exploits Phoebe's involvement with the Ghostbusters permanently in the hope that the Ghostbusters will be no more. Phoebe argues with her mother and Gary before rushing up to her room. And after a little while, Gary and Callie come to tell Phoebe that the reason they aren't letting her go out on missions is to protect her. Now, obviously enough, this is basically the family drama that is going on in this movie. So there's like, so there, there's definitely family drama in this movie. Like, Phoebe is basically being benched from you know hunting down go- from hunting down ghosts, right? And this is something that Phoebe likes. Phoebe likes science, and she likes to you know go ghost ghost hunting. And that was that was basically that, and that was that was and that was the thing that happened in Ghostbusters Afterlife. She loves science so much and of course being introduced to the world to being introduced to ghost hunting. Especially from the help of her grandfather, Egon Spangler. And on top of that, she's being benched and this gets her upset. And I feel for her in this situation. Now, yes, she is still a kid, she's fifteen years old. And at the same time, like Walter Peck said, like what Walter Peck mentions, that she shouldn't be, you know, like, and at the same time, she shouldn't be, you know, out there, you know, she shouldn't be out there zappy ghost with the proton pack. I mean, obviously, it's like a gun, right? This proton pack is basically like a gun. And, and it's, and Phoebe, being a kid that she is, is firing this proton pack, like, she has, like, firing this proton pack. Like, like she wants, like she doesn't give her crap. Like knowing the fact that she causes millions and billions and billions of dollars of damage in the opening of the movie, destroying buildings, you know. But, but, but you kind of realize that yeah, Phoebe is basically reckless. So maybe not give Phoebe the proton pack. You know, just, just don't give Phoebe the proton pack. I think that is the best way to do. Instead of like, oh yeah, you're 15, you're 15 years old, you, you should not be a part of this group. Like, why kick her out of the group? That does not make sense at all. 
Like, she can still be a part of the group, but just don't let her, you know, fire a proton pack. Like, I mean, what the hell? She doesn't even need to use a proton pack. They, they could just, you know, hey, we can have you along on the missions, but just we're not gonna let we're not gonna allow you to use this proton pack, okay? In my opinion, that should have been a good compromise. Like, yes, we can still have Phoebe be involved in missions, but we're not gonna let her use a proton pack. But no, that's not what they did. They just, you know, they just set her off to the side, you know, just have her do nothing at all. And that's just basically, and that's just basically it. I find this as a bit of a problem on a writing standpoint. Like they, like from a writing standpoint. Now, look, I give Gil Kennan and Jason Reitman credits for um, writing this movie, but I feel like they should have just, you know, have Phoebe stay on the mission for hunting ghosts, but not use a proton pack. I feel like they should have just l let Phoebe continue on the ghost hunting missions. Just don't give her a proton pack. That is the, just don't let her use a proton pack. That's the best decision. But no, you know, they just, but you know, the family just decided like, you know what, Phoebe, we're not going to have you on, we're not going to have you on missions. That is just a low blow. That's, in my opinion, that's just a low blow. And that really upsets Phoebe because that's like taking, taking something that she really likes, like a skill that she enjoys so much and now it's being taken away. You know what I'm saying, right? I'm just say, I'm just saying, and I can understand Phoebe, Phoebe's side of the story. I mean, at the, also at the same time, I also understand where Walter Peck was coming from, knowing the fact that Phoebe is 15, and of course she's a minor. Don't forget, she's a minor. She's a kid who is basically, you know, doing all this stuff, and not and Phoebe not realizing the amount the amount of damage she has caused to the city, and be while being reckless with this proton pack. I mean, I'm just saying. But for Ryan's standpoint, I mean, I feel like her being benched in this movie was not a, was not a great move in my personal was not a great move in my personal opinion. But anyway, we're gonna move. But anyway, we're gonna move forward. Phoebe runs away and she meets up with Melody to research the to research the facility and uses Winston's extraction equipment to protect herself as a ghost for two minutes. So, uh, astral project. So, an astral project. Pro astral projection, I guess. So Phoebe can know what it is like. W so that way, Phoebe can use it to know to come to realize and know what is it like to be a ghost. But also, but also to connect with Melody, and physically interact with her. Now, Melody and Phoebe. Now, Melody and Phoebe. I, in my opinion, I think they were they were both very good in this movie. Like. You know the the chemistry now the interaction between the two of them were were actually very good and I and that's one of the few things from this movie I I actually enjoy like seeing Phoebe connect with a connect with a ghost in this movie now Melody is being played by Emily Allen Lind and they and she does a very and she does a very good job both McKenna Grace and and em, and Emily Allen Lind do a very good job do a very good job in this movie Another thing that I have a gripe with is I feel like those two should. I feel like the the dynamic between the two should have the dynamic between the friendship should have extended a little bit more, in my personal opinion. And and this is also noting the noting, noting the fact that Phoebe is connecting is interacting with a ghost more than her human counterparts in this movie, right? Because because the one thing I was wondering. Where was podcast? I mean, I know pod. I mean, what happened to pod? Her and podcast, like, like podcast, like podcast and Phoebe were able to interact in Ghostbusters Afterlife a lot more, and I know, and I know, and I know that podcast is with uh, Ray is with Ray in this movie. Now, of course, now granted, they bo now granted both podcast and Phoebe do interact a little bit in the movie but not a whole lot like i was expecting a little more friendship between podcast and phoebe a little more but why why am i getting the feeling that phoebe and the and the ghosts are interacting a lot more than you know phoebe interacting with human characters that's what i'm kind of kind of wondering but at the same time it is pretty it is pretty nice to see phoebe interacting with someone that is like you know not human, I guess, because obviously, let's be honest. Melody was a was it was a human before she 
before she died in a fire accident and is now basically a ghost. But also at the same time that Phoebe is being turned into a ghost for only two minutes, right? She's basically a ghost for two minutes, which I feel like that should have been like, you know, two hours. Like Phoebe should have been a ghost for two hours. You know, that way Phoebe and Melody could be, you know, just have fun. What is it like to hang out as a ghost with another ghost? I feel like that should have been, you know, should have been something that should have been added. I feel like that should have been something that should have been added in a look that should have been added into the movie. Although, yes, Phoebe is a ghost in this movie for a little bit, but her being a ghost a little more, that should have been added. But that's just my opinion. But, but it turns out Melody backstabbed Phoebe because Melody was is the Melody was working for Garaka who had uh, who offered her a passage to the afterlife in return. So Garaka gets Phoebe to recite the ritual chant, allowing the demon ghost to reclaim all the power in his horns and. The horns were from um, Nadim's, uh, Nadim's apartment and relocating them on his head and escapes, covering the entirety of New York in snow and, in snow and ice. And was also, and even before that happened, um, Celeste O'Connor, who plays um, Lucky, like she, she tries to, she tries to stop Garaka with her proton pack, but. Well, she, but what Gar Garaka does is Garaka freezes the entire proton pack. Like once, once Lucky fired her proton pack at Garaka, like like Garaka doesn't feel the electronic proton packs. And what Garaka does next, he uses his hand, touches the lightning on the proton pack, and it freezes the entire pack. Like holy shit! Isn't that insane? Like, like you know these proton packs explode. Like, these proton packs explode when, once it crosses the streams. But I have never seen anything like, like a proton pack being frozen. Like, like that is next level. Like, that is literally next level. That is a next level. That is next level. And Garaka, and Garaka is basically a next level threat. Like he's an intimidating foe. Like he's an intimidating foe in this. In this, he's an intimidating foe in this movie. But anyway, but like I said, I'm gonna get to him more a little bit because he deserves a little more screen time than that. But anyway, moving forward, um, the rest of the Ghostbusters realize that the demon will freeze all the specters in the compartment unit, having already frozen all the all all the ones in the research center. And they gather everyone together in an attempt to save the firehouse and their headquarters. And of course, Nadim, who is struggling to you know learn his firemaster ways, wears the brass armor that was kept by his grandmother, and he practices his power just as Garaka approaches. And the entire city being frozen. This is basically the ice age moment right there. Like we see the ice age in this in in the final act of this movie, and at the same time, <clears throat> it's cool, eerie, and spooky at the same time because it's dead. The town is dead silent, and all we see in this movie is basically the new Ghostbusters and the original Ghostbusters coming together to face off against Garaka, and we get that we even get a funny entrance from Bill Murray. He says. He comes in, he comes in, like, after banging on the door, knowing the fact that he was, that the door was basically barricade, and, and Fakeman's like, anybody in need of some assistance? And the, one of the other things that he saw in this movie is, uh, Mel, is Melnitz, Melnitz, who is basically being played, Janine Melnitz, who is basically being played by Andy Potts, like, he sees, he sees Melnitz in uniform, and you hear him say this line, Melnitz in uniform, like he is surprised to see Jan he's surprised to see Janine Melnitz in uniform, and that is amazing. That is amazing. I, I find it awesome to see that Melnitz is wearing the the wearing the Ghostbusters uniform, and I think that was a good way to you know bring in bring her bring her on to this film. But but anyway, but anyway, moving but anyway, moving forward, Garaka. Garaka is here and he comes in and the atmosphere is is cold 
dark and hellish at the same time. The You feel the atmosphere of the room. The chills coming down your spine once you're seeing Garaka in full form. Especially with these deviled horns that he's got on his head. Like, this is bas- this is basically the in my opinion, this is the ice devil from a from an icy hell. Like, literally. Like, the Ghostbusters have never faced a threat like this before. Like, Garaka is a next level threat right there. And he's standing there and he's just standing there walking tall, about to freeze the Ghostbusters and 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 while uh, and while the Ghostbusters were able to use the proton packs, they were all frozen. Garaka freezes them, freezes all the proton packs. But there is one proton pack that um, Phoebe invents that Phoebe invented, and and it's basically it's basically brass. It's a br- it's a proton pack where it's basically using brass as 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 some sort of electrifying element. To stop Garaka. Now Phoebe uses brass to electrify Egon Spangler's proton pack, and Garaka. Now Phoebe uses brass to electrify Egon Spangler's proton pack, and she uses that to, you know, to cause, you know, cause to cause damage on Garaka. Even Garaka's surprised because this is a new element that is basically used to stop Garaka. But unfortunately, Garaka gains the upper hand, and. He's basically more powerful than the gang and freezes all of them. All of them. And also, Garaka portrays Melody, causing her to transition to help the gang out. And also to add this in, the the possessor, the possessor ghost, the little red, the little red misty electric ghost possesses Ecto-1, the Ghostbusters car in this very scene. And it is basically a demon car from hell. Like, what the hell is going on in this scene? Like, like you got Garaka and the Ecto-1 car being possessed all, all in one setting. Like, that is crazy. Like, this is like, is this, is this a horror movie we're watching? Like, <laughs> like I, like, that's something you don't see every day. Now, I feel like that's a reference to... I feel like the car being possessed, I feel like that's a reference to another horror movie that came out. And I think it's called Christine, I believe. I mean, I believe that's that's the reference that it's going for. But that's, but I don't know. Maybe maybe that's the reference that it's trying to go for. But at the same time, the, the, the Ecto-1 car being possessed by the possessor, that was scary as hell right there. And on top of that, the and on top of that, uh, uh, the possessor... Was actually the possessor was being eaten by Slimer at the end, and Slimer eats the possessor while being possessed inside this pizza, and Slimer just eats it up. Even Trevor s- sees it all, and he, and he was like, "Yes, yes, told you that Slimer was there," and he was telling that in front of some of the other Ghostbusters members, and they were like, "Yeah." So anyway, uh, moving forward. So anyway, moving forward, uh, Melody helps out the Ghostbusters gang, and. And you and helps Nadim to utilize his firepower, revealing himself as the new firemaster, while Ray and the rest of the Ghostbusters and the ex receptionist Janine Melnet help defeat Garaka by turning the compartment into a giant ghost trap. This, along along with the fire, help melt Garaka into dust, and he is finally captured in the compartment. And that's how Garaka is being defeated. So after that, Melody and Phoebe share one last goodbye before Melody moves on to the afterlife to reconcile with her family. And despite the gang doing an excellent job at saving New York, Walter Peck still refuses to thank the Ghostbusters before the, the before the crowd starts booing at him. And even one crowd member even calls him dickless because if you remember in the first Ghostbusters movie, um, Ray tells the mayor that everything in the everything everything in the power at the firehouse was fine until the power was shut off by Dickless here. Like he calls Walter Peck Dickless, but Peck was like, "No, no, those guys caused the explosion." And the mayor is like, "Is this true?" But thankfully, <laughs> Vakeman, oh, Vakeman responds back by saying, "Yes, it's true. This man has no dick." Like <laughs> 
Oh my goodness, like Bill Murray and his comeback lines, man. <laughs> Never cease to disappoint. Like that was one of the best insults from 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 the Ghostbusters movies. <laughs> And I and I like how they they were able to make a call. They were able to, you know, name drop it. Like this one member in the crowd who's booing at Walter Pack. He says, "Hey, Dickless, you're not gonna get rid of those Ghostbusters, aren't you?" And it's so funny. It's so out of nowhere, but it's so funny at the same time. And Walter Pack is trying so so hard not to, you know, praise the Ghostbusters. Busters is like. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Ghostbusters saved everything, hooray! Like, in his mind, you can tell, like, mm, those Ghostbusters, I will get them one of these days. They will be shut down forever one of these days. But at the same time, it's like, it seems as though he's trying so hard not to, like, praise them, but it's like, but at the same time, he's like, you know, whatever. So, <laughs> he reverses the decision on kicking Phoebe out of the out of the Ghostbusters. So Phoebe is back on the Ghostbusters team and just then Slimer and the other ghosts escape and they all go after them with Trevor finally be able to drive the Ghostbusters car. And we even get to see a tribute we get to see a text memorial tribute to Ivan saying for Ivan because as I mentioned Ivan Reitman was the original director for the original Ghostbusters movie. And of course the, as the credits roll a truck driver departs his vehicle carrying Stave Puffed Marshmallows to make a purchase at a nearby vending machine when the mini Stave Puffed Marshmallows steal the truck. And that's basically it. That is basically the breakdown of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Now, now there are some things I want to talk about from this movie. Now, my thoughts. I enjoyed the movie. I had fun with this movie. I thought the film was fun. There were flaws in this movie in terms of the writing and... I've already mentioned now I've already mentioned the uh, you know Phoebe being you know benched being benched from the Ghostbusters and of course uh, Phoebe and Melody I've already mentioned I've already mentioned that but there are a few other things I want to mention from this movie but before that I will say this I I thought the overall idea of the Frozen Empire film was a good idea I thought it was a good idea to, I thought it was a good idea I thought the plot idea was good the casting as the casting the, the cast members did a very good job and of course um, the villain was pretty good too but i will get to more of the villain pretty in a, in a minute but you know but knowing the fact that the, but the film itself is very nostalgic like it, it's really nostalgic it's a nostalgic movie and and it calls back to the first two ghostbusters movies and also the you know ghostbusters afterlife movie which i really enjoyed also, I forgot to mention this. They even they even sh played a clip of the Ghostbusters music video, one of the montages of the Ghostbusters being famous. You know, they're basically famous in toys, food, basically being famous in merchandise, and, and of course, other spans of media as well, including a music video. So I find it funny how it was put into the movie, so it's technically canon. <laughs> But anyway, <clears throat> now some of the things I want to bring up. Um, first of all, I want to bring up uh, the villain Garaka and the whole Ice Age plot. Now, I like the overall idea, as I mentioned. I thought it was a very cool idea. But in my opinion, Garaka and the whole Ice Age plot, that should have happened near the second act, in my opinion. Yes, we do get hints of, like, of the froze. Of, we do get hints of that. We do get, you know, frozen details of that. A little bit of throws frozen details throughout the movie, but in my opinion, it wasn't enough. Especially when um, one of the scientists named Lars, who touches the orb and it freezes his hand, like we got to see that. But uh, and then of course the backstory, uh, Garaka's backstory, which was presented by Patton Oswalt's character, and of course the opening, which features the firefighters where that entire uh, conference room was frozen, we saw that, and that was basically it. I feel, and, and I feel like Garaka, Garaka should have started at Ice Age, and I want to say in a different location, giving the idea of how, how big of a threat that he is. You know, like, it should have been in a different town in New York City. But I'm just saying, like, that should have been, you know, it, he should have started at Ice Age and in, different, in a different town location. 
giving people the idea of how big of a threat he is. That should have happened in the second act, and that way the Ghostbusters can investigate can investigate it and asking themselves, what's going on? Why? What's with this whole? Why does the town look like a look like an icy hell or something? You know, that will give the audiences an idea of how big of a how how big of a threat that that Garaka is, and of course introducing uh introducing his ghost army like like why did, couldn't he bring in a ghost army in in that scenario in that scenario like that would add another layer to his character and that way the ghostbusters can stop that ghost army like why couldn't he do that why wasn't that put into the writing you know what i'm saying like like this is on a writing standpoint if you know what i'm saying right like why couldn't he do that? And Garaka, like, and Garaka, Garaka, in my opinion, is a great villain in this movie, and he should have gotten more screen time. Like he should have been, he should have come in during the second act. You know, like, like he should have come in during the second act, show off his powers, and you know, show off his powers and his threat and the whole Ice Age idea. You know what I'm saying? Like that should have happened a little more. But yet again, I still like him. Like. He's he's a cool villain in this movie, like, I mean sure he's n I mean sure I, I mean sure he's nowhere near the level of uh, of Gozer of Gozer, but at the same time, still an intimidating threat. He still poses a great th a huge threat to the Ghostbusters. I even liked how uh, Peter Vakeman, who Peter Vakeman's uh, little line of dialogue that he says like when he saw Garaka, he says tall, dark, and horny at twelve o'clock. <laughs> oh man, that is so funny. That is so funny. And yeah, again, he was still a good villain. I feel like he, in my opinion, he he should have gotten more screen time. And speaking of characters, like and speaking of characters that should have gotten scre more screen time, Peter Venkman should have gotten a little more screen time too. Like, like, like why? I mean, he was more of a cameo in this movie compared to you know Ghostbusters Afterlife. Like. He appeared with with he appeared with Ray and um, with Ray and Winston throughout the third act and 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 I don't know why he wasn't in this movie a lot more. I mean, we only see him for um, for the for the final battle in that one scene that he was with that he was having and that one scene with Nadine. That's it. Like he should have gotten more screen time. Like what about a scene with Dana? You know Sigourney Weaver's character, like what happened to that? And this would this is a good segue in. Sigourney Weaver, who plays uh, Dana Dana in the original Ghostbusters movies, she was not in this movie, and I don't know why she wasn't in this movie. I I feel like that entire that that, that I feel like the question and answer of her of her not appearing in this movie is is up in the air. I don't know why she's not in this movie. But I but I heard rumors that she was that that there were that the writers were going to, were planning to have her as a possible Ghostbuster in this movie. So that we're gonna have to have her be a possible Ghostbuster in a Ghostbusters sequel. And I think that was planned for a possible third film that they were originally gonna do. But unfortunately, that did not happen. And her not and her not appearing in the Frozen Empire movie. Is is a bit disappointing. Is basically is in my opinion disappointing. Like I I really I I now look I like Sigourney Weaver, but I feel like the filmmakers could have at least put in a role, could have wrote something in for Sigourney Weaver's character. I mean, she got a cameo in Ghostbusters Afterlife during the end credit scene where she was with uh, Peter Venkman doing this uh, elect. You know, d during this uh, shock test with the with those little cards from the first movie, if you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> but yeah, again, I mean, it is disappointing that we didn't see um, Dana being played by Sigourney Weaver in this movie. Like, we didn't, we did, we did not see that in this movie. I mean, I ho if if they're gonna continue on with the franchise, I hope she makes an appearance. But we don't really know. But but anyway, moving. But anyway, moving forward. Um. But anyway, moving. But anyway, moving forward. Um, Nadim as the fire master. Now, I thought. It, it, now, in my opinion, it sounded like an awesome idea. But 
but having Firemasters and Ghostbusters at the same time sounds a little weird. Now, sure, yes, even though the Ghostbusters are in a firehouse, that doesn't tackle, that doesn't mean that they're fire masters. Like, that doesn't mean that they're fire masters. Yes, the Ghostbusters are hanging out in the firehouse because that's their hideout area where they're storing all the ghosts. But, but if you're talking fire master, you you know, I mean, fire master in a firehouse, that's basically being a firefighter, right? You know, firefighter, fire, firefighter in a firehouse, I get it, I get it. Ghostbusters in a firehouse, sure, in my mind, I'm, that doesn't make sense either. But, but at the same time, like, this is Ghostbusters we're talking about, right? Like, why would we have a character who is a fire master and all sorts of things? Like... Why couldn't there? Why couldn't that be used as another, you know, proton pack idea? Why couldn't they invent another proton pack where they use, where the Ghostbusters use a fire weapon, where they use fire, elect or electric, use some sort of fire weapon in a proton pack to, you know, to defeat Garaka, if you know what I'm saying. Why couldn't they use that? I mean, that's kind of an idea. That's basically an idea right there. But, but at the same time. I feel like that feels more. I feel like Nindim as a fire master in this movie. It feels like it feels like Avatar: The Last Airbender, if you know what I'm saying. Like Nindim being a fire master and firebender, if you know what I'm saying. Like that belongs in Avatar: The Last Airbender, in my opinion, and not in a Ghostbusters movie. Like I feel like now Nindim now now Nindim was an interesting character in this movie, and I and I thought he was pretty, and I thought the actor who played him was very good. It's just the idea of having, you know, a firemaster alongside a ghostbuster, a um, firemaster alongside ghostbusters. Like the idea is there, but I feel like it, it felt silly to me in my opinion. That's just my opinion. But, you know, at the same time, I I still enjoy his I still like his character in this movie, but, you know, like I said, I, I didn't like the overall idea at, at, about that. Now, of course, moving on to other characters, um uh, while podcast, I feel like podcast got a little more screen time in this because since he was working with Ray, I thought that was pretty good too. But I was disappointed in some of the other characters too, like uh, Lucky, like Lucky and Trevor. Like Lucky and Trevor, they had more screen time, a little more. They had a little bit more screen time in the in the other movie compared to this movie, since I was, since there were a lot of characters in this movie. I, I'll say this. And and I feel like it was a little hard to balance for the you know the main characters and of course the uh, the support and of course the supporting characters too. Like Ray and Winston had more screen time in this movie, and they were basically the heavy hitters the heavy hitters out of the original Ghostbusters members. I barely remember Callie in this movie. I feel like Callie and Mr. Gruberson were barely in this movie at all. Now they were still in it. Now all the actors do a good job in this movie. But I feel like the like the supporting ca- the characters I feel like the characters were barely in this movie at all. They were barely a focus, and I feel like the main focus was more on you know um, Phoebe. Phoebe was obviously the main focus of this movie. Like Phoebe, Phoebe was ma- was the main focus on this movie in my opinion. Like like she was bent. She was she was benched throughout the entire movie, and she connects with the ghost. Not knowing the fact that she was in a, you know, not knowing the fact that this entire threat is based, there's an entire ice age threat going, ice age threat going on. If you know what I'm saying, right? Going back to Lucky and and Trevor, like they were barely like Trevor, like Trevor, like Lucky, Lucky was barely in this movie. She barely had anything to do. Her only moment came in was when she was using the proton pack against Garaka, and it got fro and it got frozen, and Phoebe saw all of it. And Phoebe was right there. Phoebe was right there, knocked out cold. Both of them were knocked out cold in that very instance, and that was the only scene I remember of seeing luck, uh, seeing Lucky in. And then of course the old uh, firehouse, uh, and then of course the firehouse during the final battle. And then on top of that, and then on top of that, and then on top of that, uh, Trevor. Now Trevor. Now I thought Trevor's only moments in that movie was basically him and Slimer, like he tried to trap Slimer. By you know leading a trail of uh, Cheetos to a ghost trap, and obviously it failed. 
but it was a very funny moment. And seeing Slimer in this movie is, was fun, too. Like, I wish we could have got a little more Slimer in this movie. But at the same time, it was nice to see him. But Trevor, I feel like Trevor deserves better, too. Now, I love Finn Wolfhard. He deserves better in the sequel. Like, even his character is a mechanic, too. Like, we see him, we see that in the beginning of the movie where he tries to fix something in the car. Like, the air conditioner, like the AC, I believe, and whatever other things in the car. Like, that's basically it. But that's just my opinion. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, Trevor, I feel like Trevor should have got a little more to do in this movie. You know, instead of that one scene, instead of those two scenes that we got of him and Slimer and, and of course, you know, that be the beginning as well. But he should have got a little something more to do. Like, I like those scenes, but I want more of that. I want a little more of that from Trevor. Even Lucky as well. I want to see a little more of Luck Lucky too. Like she was, she was one of the new members in this new f Ghostbusters facility. Like we should have got a little more of that, in my personal opinion. But also another thing that I completely forgot that 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 the one, another thing that that was completely forgotten is basically uh, Callie Spangler. Like Callie's the mother to Phoebe and Trevor, but she's also the daughter to Egon Spangler. And we never, and we don't even know who 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 her real mom is. We don't even know that. Like we don't know that. We don't know who her real mom is. And plus, we don't even know who her original husband was either. Well, like we don't even know that at all. And I hope this is something that we get to see in a future Ghostbusters movie if they continue with this franchise. But. I don't know. Maybe that's something they may do in future installments down the line, but we'll see. But that was one other thing that I completely forgot, and I and that disappointed me too, is that we could have gotten a little more of Callie's backstory of her, of you know who her mom was, and of course who her husband was, because because you know you know how did how did Callie how did Callie how did Callie how did Callie, how did Callie had. Um, Phoebe and Trevor, you know? Just know what I'm saying. Like, like, who was her husband, if you know what I'm saying? Like, what happened to Callie's husband? And, and of course, Callie's mom, too, right? Right? But we don't know. I mean, that's, that's probably something that we'll f probably find out in a future installment, if there's ever one. And uh, one last thing to bring up. Uh, Melnitz, uh, Janine Melnitz, Annie Potts' character, like, she's barely in this movie, too. Like, we get to see her in this movie, but, but not, but not for, but not for long. Only, and in my opinion, only the final battle is when we get to see her. And that was, and that was pretty, and that was actually nice. And, and it's nice to see Janine Melnitz in this movie. Like, like we see Annie Potts' character in the other in the in the Ghostbusters Afterlife movie, and now we get to see her again in in Frozen Empire, which is nice. But also at the same time, I feel like she should have gotten a little more screen time. Speaking of which, the uh, the line of speaking of which, a scene of hers was cut from from the was cut from this movie, and that was played in the trailer, and that was when she was answering a phone call saying, "Ghostbusters, what do you want?" Like. That was cut from the movie, right? That was like one of the main calls, right? That was one of the main. That was like her um, catchphrase. That was like her catchphrase in in the in the original Ghostbusters movie. Like she's a phone receptionist and she answers the call saying, "Ghostbusters, what do you want?" And she listens to the call and saying that, "Oh yeah, there's a ghost problem going on." And and she ans and she hangs up the phone and says, "We got one," like. Why wasn't why was that cut from the Frozen Empire movie? I don't get it. Like that 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 should have been you know like that should have been a thing in that movie, right? Isn't that one of the main character aspects for Janine for Janine Melnitz's character? But that's just me. But that's just but you know they should have kept that in. And then and then of course um and, and then of course uh, later on and then of course later on um. And then of course another thing that I feel like they should have added is having the real having the original Ghostbusters members and the uh, and then of course the new Ghostbusters team up to you know you know to team up and and stop a ghost 
in a uh, you know in a different location. You know, like in the first Ghostbusters movie, like their first mission, their first job is f- was capturing Slimer in that in that fancy hotel, and and that's that's kind of something, and that's something that the that the, the, the that the old Ghostbusters, the new Ghostbusters should have done. They should have had a scene where all the Ghostbusters members team up, new and old hunt down a ghost in a hotel restaurant or something like that way it calls back to the original film but also passing of a little bit of a passing of the torch showing the new ghostbusters how 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 this how the job works you know what i'm saying right but anyway but anyway that's that's all in terms of my criticisms that i have for this movie now plot wise i like the plot but i feel like the execution the overall execution should have been better like in terms of the writing in my in my personal opinion but nevertheless but but overall i still enjoyed this movie even though it was a flawed movie i had fun i had fun with this movie and i thought it was a good way to celebrate 40 years of of the Ghostbusters franchise, and I hope this franchise and I hope this franchise continues on. Because I I want to see more Ghostbusters. I really really do, and I and I I really really do, and I hope the fan base of and I hope the Ghostbusters Ghostbusters fan base would love to see more Ghostbusters in the near future. But anyway, that is it. That is my that is basically my take on Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. And to those are to those who are listening, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And to anybody out there, have have you? And to anybody out there, what did you all think of Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire? Did you like the movie? Did you not like the movie? Did you think the movie was better than Ghostbusters: Afterlife? I would love to hear your thoughts. And if I miss out on anything from Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire, please comment below if I miss out on anything from Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire. But anyway, that is a wrap on this episode. Thank you all for tuning into Kodo Cinema. I'm your host, Mark Kodo, a.k.a. Kodo Man. Remember to watch movies, stay positive, and good night. Until next week.